go ahead and get started. Um, we have some people in the room. So before I go ahead and um, turn it over completely to Dr. David Osai, I actually just really wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. As you can tell, David Osai is actually still at HHMI and he is three hours ahead of us. So um, um, we're really glad to have him here. I wanted to show a little bit about the seminar series in case you haven't stepped in to one of our series in the past. Um, we have a, we started a, a series in the School of Biological Sciences, and we invite in expert speakers to help us think about how do we consider diversity, equity, inclusion better um, in our teaching professional development. So this is really geared for graduate students and undergraduate learning assistants, um, but also you can tell like it's very relevant for administrators and faculty. Um, and um, what we were hoping for is that as we learn how to teach better for graduate students and undergraduates and even faculty as we learn how to teach better, um, we want to um, also help to show that you can actually get a certificate in this. So part of this program, if you attend to six or uh, more of these talks, um, we will actually provide a, 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 um, a certificate of completion uh, detailing your involvement and dedication to promoting excellence and inclusion in STEM education. Um, and you just need to um, complete some assessments um, after each talk to just um, help us know that you are kind of engaging with the material and thinking about how to apply it into your particular contexts. Um, one of the things you'll see for those of you in person is that we have these QR codes around. If you could go ahead and if you haven't already, um, go in and sign in just so we know that you're here. Um, one of the things you also notice is that we do have refreshments here. So for part of the funding for these events where we can have refreshments and have more informal conversation um, is that we do need to note that people were here <laughs> and um, there was a reason why we had refreshments here. So by signing in, you can help make sure that these, these events happen um, in the future. Okay, so um, go ahead and do that. Um, I want to in, uh, introduce Dr. David Asai. Um, he's currently the Senior Director of Science Education at the Howard uh, Hughes Medical Institute. He's also an elected fellow of the American Association for the uh, Advancement of Science, as well as the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, at the HHMI, he applies the same methods of having rigor um, and the same methods that we value in scientific research um, for understanding the causes that underlie some of the disparities that we have in science, technology, education, and um, mathematics participation. And he actually has a background both in chemistry and biology. He did his bachelor's uh, degree in chemistry at Stanford and then his PhD in biology at Caltech. Um, and then after that, he moved on to a faculty position at Harvard Med College, where he also became um, the uh, head of the biological sciences or department chair there, and then also the head of biological sciences and a school professor at Purdue University before he went and um, joined his current position at HHMI. Um, his current work really focuses on the diversity and inclusion in um, science, especially in um, the context of race and ethnicity. And I think his scholarship and his leadership has really helped us see the deficit, or so, sorry, see the failures of a deficit-based approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, he's really helped to encourage us to build the community that we want to see at our institutions, even helped us to form the language, I think, to talk about these issues. Um, so he is a captivating storyteller. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome him. I won't share too much more. Um, we do have refreshments in the back, but you could actually um, enjoy them outside after the talk um, and then just keep your mask on. The current UCI policy is to keep masks on indoors. Um, so I will turn it over to him. I'm going to um, go ahead and turn the camera over so he can actually see you um, as he talks. Hi, folks. I can see a few folks. Can you see me? Can you? All right. So you're waving. All right. That's good. All right. Well, I, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, well, actually, I'm sorry I'm not there, but I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. I actually did my um, most of my experimental work for my doctorate 
not too far from where uh, some of you are, uh, down at Corona Del Mar. So Caltech has a marine lab at Corona Del Mar, and I did all of my experimental work down there, and then I spent uh, the other part of my time up in Pasadena. So um, I remember driving past UCI, and um, back then it was not nearly as built up that area as it is now. Uh, so um, uh, I wish I were back to, to sort of see how things have changed. Well, I'm a cell biologist. And um, as you heard from Professor Liu, I spent 24 years doing research, teaching and administration. I was first at Purdue University and then at Harvey Mudd College. My research lab studied the molecular motor dynein. As a student, I studied, as you heard, chemistry and biology. So among the many subjects that I did not study are psychology, sociology, anthropology, education, ethnic studies, economics, history, law, and many other disciplines. And so I think that makes me like many other scientists. I don't have a foundation in the disciplines that are so important to understand the scholarship of education, of mentoring, of inclusion, and culture change. So I don't know that stuff. And that means that I and we, we need to seek out and learn from others, especially those with expertise in the social sciences. So what I'm trying to say gently is that scientists sometimes have a little bit of hubris where we think that, well, because we're scientists, we don't need to acknowledge that there are things that we don't know. But indeed, there are many things that we can learn to get better at our work. So today I want to discuss race and culture of science and education. You know, the culture of academic science is centered on exclusion, exclusion. Uh, right now, I'm afraid that we too often value selection and pedigree. We emphasize competition and meritocracy. We celebrate individuality and grit and perseverance, and we declare winners. Our culture is a product of our history, and our history is uh, one that includes bad science being used to justify the social construct of race, uh, bad science that created a racialized and gendered hierarchy among people in terms of intelligence, initiative, and morality. Our culture was created by and benefits mainly white males. So for academic science to advance, it is first necessary to change our culture, to recenter our institutions on inclusion through equity. That change begins with a few champions and then grows into what I hope is an unstoppable movement. Uh, perhaps today's talk is when you join the movement. For some of you, this might be all brand new and you might be skeptical, that's okay. Others of you might be old hands and that you've already thought about diversity, equity, and inclusion for a long time. You're already part of the choir. You're, you're, you're a champion for culture change. You know, some people say, well, you know, we can't just be preaching to the choir, but I believe that the choir needs to practice as well. And so champions always need to learn. Many of you are engaged in teaching, as I understand it. And as educators, you are in the critically important role of the main way your students interact with the culture of the university. You have, therefore, the grand opportunity to walk the talk of inclusion. Now, race is what I'm gonna be talking about today. Race is a social construct. It was created by the white center of power. From the beginning of our nation, the racialization of people has been used to define who belongs and who is excluded, who may immigrate, who may become a citizen, who may vote, who may own property, whom a person may marry. You know, even persons uh, who we might call white today were not always white. A hundred years ago, newly arrived immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe were deemed inferior and therefore were categorized as non-white or colored. The racialization of people and how it has become weaponized 
is inextricably rooted in science. As Stephen Jay Gould discussed in his book, The Mismeasure of Man, the leading scientists of their time, and those included people like Agassiz and Galton, Haldane and Muller, Jordan and Millikan, these men wrongly claim that there are genetically distinct human races which evolved independently. And this idea in turn provided the scientific rationale for concocting a racialized hierarchy of humans in terms of intelligence, industriousness, ingenuity, sexuality, and criminal behavior. Scientific proof was based on measuring brain sizes, measurements that were later shown to be fraudulent. Science was the authoritative cover for enslavement, sterilization, and racial cleansing. So biological traits, the expression of melanin, the epicanthic fold, the shape of hair follicles, these biological traits were linked to the very non-biological political question of who belongs and who does not. So the, the cells of Henrietta Lacks, the men of Tuskegee, the DNA of the Havasupai people, and the telescopes atop Mauna Kea, these are all contemporary reminders that science is complicit in perpetuating and reinforcing racism. So I'd like to define very briefly with you my view of seven terms, my definition of seven terms. So the first is diversity. Diversity is a property of a group. An individual is not diverse, but contributes to the diversity of a group. To measure diversity, we need to define the group and the characteristics to be measured. Diversity is good for science. Divergent thinking drives innovation and creativity. And the greater the diversity of a group, the greater its ability to solve difficult problems. The extent of a group's diversity can be measured, can be quantified. It's a number. The second term is inclusion. Inclusion, unlike diversity, is not a number. Inclusion is a feeling. How well does an individual feel that they belong in the group? And how much does an individual feel that the system expects them to be successful? But Diversity and inclusion are closely linked because diversity without inclusion is an empty gesture. The third term is equity. Equity is the way an individual is treated, how they experience the system's rules and behaviors and how we spend resources. Equity is the opposite of equality. Equity is how we build an inclusive system. To be anti-racist is to adopt a stance in which we actively and intentionally strive to dismantle structural racism. And inclusive system, uh, an inclusive system works towards becoming anti-racist. So unlike diversity, which is a measure, uh, which is measured by a number, anti-racism is about justice and is independent of how well persons uh, from excluded ethnic or racial groups are represented. So you could have a group that's 100% persons of color, for example, but that doesn't mean that this is necessarily an anti-racist situation. If there is not social or racial justice for those people, then we still need, uh, we still have a long ways to go to become anti-racist. The fifth term that I want to uh, remind us about is uh, the so-called minority, the M word. Um, we also use uh, often URM. So minority is uh, often used synonymously, uh, uh, is, is often synonymous with the person of color. Um, it's URM is almost always in the context of race and ethnicity. But you know, if you look up the dictionary, in the dictionary, minority and its root minor, you find really two different, two main definitions, and neither of them is accurate or appropriate when referring to people. So the first definition is numerical. But persons of color are not the numerical minority. 
In fact, 85% of the world's population are persons of non-European ethnicities. And the majority of the 50 million K through 12 aged young people in the US are persons of color. This country will be majority persons of color in 20 years. The second definition of minority or minor is a pejorative. A minority is of lesser importance, of lesser significance, of lesser seriousness. A minority is diminished and subordinate. And so I would urge us to avoid using this term altogether. Instead of URMs, I use the term peers, persons excluded from science because of their ethnicity or race. The term peers <clears throat> shifts the burden from they who are excluded and instead places the responsibility on the system that, it, that is doing the excluding. <clears throat> so this um, visit to Irvine comes at a, uh, an important time in my family's history. 80 years ago tomorrow, on February 17, 1942, uh, my family, uh, who was living at the time on Terminal Island in Los Angeles Harbor, they were told by the US government that they had to leave. And in 10 days, on February the 27th, they all left and they were able to take with them only what they could carry. Executive Order 9066 provided the legal authority to round up the approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans residing on the West Coast. Two thirds of them, like my father and my aunt, my mother, her brother, they were all US citizens by birth. And they placed all of these folks in internment camps. Now my family was incar incarcerated in the Poston, Arizona internment camp, which is located near Lake Havasu on the Colorado River. Uh, it, it is uh, actually on the land of the Colorado River Band res um, Indian Reservation. It was in Poston um, where my family's name was replaced with a number, 34389. It was in Poston where my parents met and then became engaged. And it was in Poston where my father's mother, my grandmother, died at the age of 48. So she never got out of the camps. I tell you that because it's important for me, but it's also important for us to understand that for all of us, regardless of our own ethnicity, regardless of our own family background, race matters for all of us. In the movie Minari, you might remember this movie from a couple of years ago, there's this scene. Um, so this is the Korean American family, you know, the mother, the father, the two kids, the grandma, and they've uh, recently moved to rural Arkansas. And so they decide one day that they should go to church. And so there's this scene where the minister asks them to stand up and to be introduced. And of course, the all white congregation turns to stare. And that scene reminds me so much of my childhood growing up in the Midwest, except that the preacher was my father. So after World War II, my father, who was already in his early 30s, he already had a bachelor's degree from Berkeley. He decided to become a Christian minister. And so he enrolled at a place called Andover Newton Seminary outside of Boston because Andover Newton was willing to admit a Japanese American. He got his first job as a pastor in a tiny church in Vermont because they couldn't afford a more experienced minister. And so for much of his career, my father was the only pastor of the only church in small towns in New England, in the Midwest. I joined a family in Vermont, and then in Vermont and Kansas, we were the only non-whites in town. I started school in Partridge, Kansas. There were about 10 of us in my first grade class. It was too small to have a kindergarten, so that was my first class, my first schooling. And, you know, <clears throat> being in the little town in Kansas back then, um, you know, teachers and students would constantly be reminding me that I was different because of my race. And of course, some of the older kids would pick on me, they would get into fights and stuff. 
they'd call me names. And I remember my mother telling me, insisting that I could not fight back because to do so would reflect badly on our family, on our race, and might jeopardize my father's job. And so then when I was in the sixth grade, we moved from tiny Kansas to bigger Hawaii. So in comparison to Partridge, Maui was huge. There were probably 60 kids in the sixth grade in my elementary school. And you know what? Nearly all of us were Asian American. In fact, I remember only one Haole in my class. So for the first time in my life, I didn't have to be conscious of being different. I didn't have to carry the burden of representing my race. And that's the sixth word to define privilege. We hear about white privilege all the time. You know, in Hawaii, I enjoyed cultural privilege. As Ijeoma Oluo, the author of So You Want to Talk About Race, points out, privilege is not something extra bestowed on a person. Privilege is actually something less. So white privilege in this country means that in science, in this country, in many universities, a white person does not have to think about their race. It's just one less thing to worry about. The seventh word to define is culture. The dictionary defines culture as the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institutional organization. Cornell West, in his landmark book, Race Matters, reminds us that our culture is manifested by our structures and our behaviors. Our challenge and our opportunity is to change the culture of science and education so that it is centered on inclusion. So a characteristic of a system that is white centered is that it is unprepared and unwilling to deeply examine race and racism. Upholding systemic racism isn't just about politicians and the police, it's also about our structures and behaviors as scientists, as people who work at a university. It is not uncommon, it is not uncommon for prominent scientists to state with certainty that an increase in diversity necessarily means a decrease in scientific excellence as if diversity and excellence are components of a zero sum game. When scientific rigor is our excuse for the lack of diversity, when in our teaching and textbooks, we tell only the stories of the white founding fathers of science, when in our recruiting of students and hiring of faculty, we rely on a person's pedigree as a proxy for scientific excellence. When we focus on individual prizes instead of encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration, when in our brochures and websites, we proudly tout how we are a very selective institution, an elite research university, a member of the AAU, and highly ranked by US News and World Report. When we do these and many other things, we are perpetuating the white center of power. A key way to change our culture is to change the content and pedagogy of our teaching. So more than two decades of data show that there is something about the way we teach science, especially in the introductory courses, that disproportionately drives away the very persons who can contribute the most to diversity in science. So instead of continuing to pursue the failed deficit-based approach of fixing the student, it is time for us to exercise our responsibility of making our teaching more inclusive, especially the introductory courses, which is really when most students choose to either stay or leave STEM. So here are three R's um, that uh, I wanna uh, suggest that we think about. Um, the three R's are to re reimagine, to reform and recenter. So reimagine the, cult, the content of our courses. In other disciplines, and 
For example, um, you might ask students what they took in their introductory course in literature or history or the arts. You know, even in those introductory courses, the very first course, English 101 or whatever it is at, at Irvine, the students are asked to share their reflections and impressions after they've read a book or they've looked at a painting or listened to some music or, 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 or listened to a debate or, or wh whatever the topic. And so they're asked, what do they think? They're asked to reflect and, and, and share their impressions. But in science, in our introductory courses, way too often, we don't ask our students what they think. We ask them what they know. We ask them what they've memorized from textbooks that are really too massive uh, to, uh, to really get through. They're just massive compendia of facts. So as educators, um, we have to find ways to ask our students what they think rather than what they know. And it's important for us to help our students recognize the difference between an encyclopedia and a syllabus. As educators, let us tell the stories and the tales of discovery, which is often the product of accidental convergences of disconnected observations made by persons from different backgrounds, rather than simply featuring the winners of the Nobel Prize. Let us talk about our mistakes as well as our successes. Let us talk about the sad stories when science was unfortunately misused to perpetuate racism and social injustice. So we can do that right now. The second thing is to reform our laboratory courses. Our laboratory courses should be organized opportunities for students to engage in the process of open-ended discovery, such as through course-based research experiences, rather than a series of exercises for which we already know the answer. So let us encourage our students to embrace uncertainty, to explore curiosity, to evaluate evidence, rather than to grade them on the correct number of significant figures they have in their lab reports. Now, I'm not saying that this is what you do. I'm just making some observations that I've seen across the country. And then the third R is to recenter on belonging. The introductory course should be when students are encouraged to explore ideas rather than a time to weed out 18 year olds uh, because we wanna protect the sanctity of our discipline. Let us assess student learning using clearly articulated competencies rather than grade on a curve. And let us ensure that course prerequisites prepare students to learn rather than being an arbitrary barrier that excludes students. So for many years at Purdue and Harvey Mudd, I taught introductory biology. I taught introductory cell biology. Uh, my course was a combination of cell biology, molecular biology, and genetics. And I really enjoyed teaching uh, early students introductory courses. Um, I taught it both to majors and to non-majors. Then and now, I believe that effective teaching should be about telling effective stories. So the other day I was thinking about, I was reflecting, I was remembering, I looked back through my notes about the stories that I used to tell in my introductory courses. And you know, I realized that I felt compelled to, uh, to tell the great truths in biology and the founding fathers who are credited with those discovery, discoveries. So, just from my notes, I was just I just wrote down the people that I featured, the stories I told about them. And here's just a, a smattering of them. Um, so uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, Charles Darwin, Francis Galton, Oswald Avery, H.J. Muller, Alfred Hershey, James Watson and Francis Crick, Max Delbruck, Salvador Luria, Matt Messelson, Frank Stahl, Hans Spemann, George Pallotti, Michael Brown and Joe Goldstein. All of these folks all of these men made some great discoveries. Now, um, at the time, of course, I was actually aware of the cultural homogeneity of all of these stories, of all of these founding fathers. And so when I could, 
I inserted a few stories of women scientists who contributed to these great, story, great, great discoveries. I talked about Margaret Chase, for example, who was the Chase in the Hershey Chase Waring Blender experiment that won Alfred Hershey his Nobel Prize. I talked about Hilda Brocholt Mangold, who did the experiments that identified the Spemann organizer that won Hans Spemann his Nobel Prize. And I told the story of Rosalind Franklin and photograph, one, and photograph 51, that was the key to the Watson and Crick Nobel Prize. Uh, but you know, thinking back on how I talked about the stories of these women, I realized that I portrayed them often, not really as discoverers of truths, but more as sort of sympathetic, even tragic figures how they had been ignored and in two of these cases had died before giving before receiving the credit that was due to them. So what would I do differently now if I were back teaching my introductory course at Irvine? Well, a couple of things. One, I would seek opportunities to point out how science has affected society, sometimes in the wrong way. For example, I would talk about how scientists created false race-based hierarchies to explain intelligence and social behavior when I was talking about genetics. I would talk about uh, the eugenics movement, uh, whose champions included some of those founding fathers like Galton and Muller. And the second thing that I would do now that was different than before is that, you know, I realized that it's very limiting to just tell the stories of the great discoveries. I mean, a student I mean, I suppose it's interesting to know who discovered, you know, the structure of DNA or who discovered uh, the, these various important things. But I think it would be perhaps even more effective to tell the stories of contemporary scientists who are building on the foundations, who are building on those great discoveries uh, put down uh, many years ago. So uh, I jotted down a list of some contemporary scientists of color each of whom has a compelling scientific story to tell. And here's just sort of a collage of some of the people that I, I thought about. So here's Kizmikia Corbett, here's Akiko Iwasaki, here's Sakobi Wilson, Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado, Veranda Montgomery, uh, Jessica Hernandez, uh, Erica Zabaleta, Harmit Malik, uh, Tracy Johnson, uh, Squire Booker, Toto Oliveira, Eric Jarvis, Norma Alcantar, Diana Bautista, Muhammad Zaman, these folks and many others are living scientists doing great stuff in STEM, in biology, in chemistry, in physics, and in engineering. And, um, and they, are, they are applying um, their fields to important problems. I think that this would make for a compelling introductory course. Well, you know, sometimes culture change uh, seems really huge and difficult. It's like turning that big cargo ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. Uh, if we want to abandon standardized tests, if we want to ignore US news and world report rankings, if we're going to overhaul the curriculum, changing promotion and tenure, you know, these are all huge tasks that appear impossible to attain. But I think that there are things that we can do, we can begin to do now to effect change that are not these huge things, but rather doable, and they're so important. So I'm going to just give you a couple of examples. The first is to adopt a growth mindset. You know, sometimes scientists fall into the trap of a fixed mindset that we can't learn something new. Of course, this attitude is ironic among scientists because science is all about making new discoveries. But for some reason, when the learning is about things in which we have little experience, hubris often takes over and minds close. You know, I've heard accomplished scientists, I mean, really accomplished scientists, and these scientists are leading diversity programs on their own campuses. I've heard them declare with certainty that good teachers are born, that knowing how to mentor is innate, that there is no room for them to learn how to be better teachers or mentors. But I believe they're wrong. So more than 20 years ago, uh, when I was department head at Purdue, 
I participated in my first forum on race. There were about 40 of us faculty. We spent two days in facilitated activities that, made, that most of us would never do on our own. We did something that we almost never do, even today. We talked about race and we grappled with race at the emotional level from the heart as well as the head. So in these two days, we participated in various exercises aimed at getting us uh, to express our own cultural identity and to understand how it feels to be excluded. And we practice listening, not listening to engage in an argument, not half listening while thinking about what to say next, but just listening to understand, to give the speaker all of our attention to hear what they had to say. So on the third day of this workshop, the facilitators asked the, facil the faculty to form a circle around the periphery of the room, and we did a fishbowl exercise in which about half a dozen recent students, recent alumni, who are persons of color, engaged in a conversation between themselves led by one of the facilitators. And because we had spent the previous two days practicing listening, I think we faculty were better prepared to hear our former students. And they were very generous. They generously shared about how it felt to be in our classrooms, in our laboratories, or in our departments. They talked about always being watched, but never seen. They talked about having to shed aspects of their cultural identity, uh, such as language or appearance, in order to be safe in our environment. They shared how it feels to have to justify every day that you belong, how it feels to constantly be on guard to survive in an environment not of their making. Now, that first forum on race marked a new beginning for me. I began to understand that it isn't simply about collecting diversity. It isn't about treating the students. Rather, the challenge is to create a more inclusive culture. So over the years, I've participated in many more such workshops. Each time I learned and I was able to practice some of the skills of inclusion. So when I moved to Harvey Mudd, we were able to cover nearly all of the faculty and senior staff in three forums. And when I moved to, Har to HHMI, our team here has hosted workshops on a variety of topics, including implicit bias, microaggressions, anti-bias, anti-racism. The, the HHMI Inclusive Excellence, the Driving Change, and the Faculty Forums Initiatives each provide funding to colleges and universities for people to engage in facilitated conversations on race and cultural differences. And in partnership with the University of Wisconsin's Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences in Research, or SIMR, the HHMI Gilliam Graduate Program provides the dissertation advisors of the Gilliam graduate students a year-long training course in culturally aware mentorship. And I know that people at Irvine are familiar with several of these programs that I've just mentioned. So the second thing that I think that we can do now is to find the time. We need to find the time to change the culture. We might want to change, we just don't have the time to do it. The real barrier to genuine culture change is often the lack of time. We need time for reflection, reflection on how the structures of science and science education uphold the white center of power and how we erect barriers to preserve the center. We need time to learn, learning the skills of inclusion and practicing the skills of listening so that we can talk candidly about race, racism and cultural privilege. And we need time to develop and implement strategies, holding ourselves accountable by taking action, changing the way we teach, changing our reward system, and then assess the effectiveness of our actions. Importantly, we need time to heal. The culture of science has excluded far too many people for far too long. To recenter our culture on inclusion through equity will require healing and forgiveness. And that's gonna take time. So let's consider what typically happens. We participate in a workshop or read a paper or come to a seminar like this one. And maybe we get fired up, we get excited. We see all the ways that we can get better. We create lists of things to do. We debate about our relative priorities. We even might even write a, a position paper or publish a list of recommendations. 
And then we re return to the realities of our day jobs. And we are almost instantly consumed and subsumed by our many other responsibilities. So instead of depending on meetings and workshops and seminars for brief spurts of inspiration, I think we need to find ways to expend more perspiration on effecting culture change on each of our campuses. What if a department or college were to suspend all other activities for a week in the fall so that the stakeholders, the faculty, the staff, the students, the alumni could all come together and engage in a series of facilitated reflection and learning activities. At the end of the week, the stakeholders uh, would collectively decide on one or two things they want to accomplish in the coming months and form broadly representative action teams. Uh, the projects should be realistic and designed to lead to bigger outcomes. So for example, um, in a year, uh, we might examine the content and organization of the introductory biology curriculum, or we might explore the process of changing the criteria for promotion and tenure. And then in the spring, we would again come back together, we would suspend all other activities and reflect on the past year, assess our progress and hold ourselves accountable to reflect on what we have learned. And then we'd repeat the process every year. So this is how leaders, this is how the leaders on your campus and on many other campuses, this is how they can actually demonstrate their commitment to diversity. They can use their influence to suspend all the other stuff that we have to do and use the time to engage in the work of culture change. Uh, we have lots of good ideas and I think we have many champions. I think it's just a matter of time. So I'd like to end my tale, my talk today uh, with a tale that perhaps some of you, you have heard me say before, but I'll, I'm gonna do it again. And this is a talk, this is a tale about culture change and responsibility. Um, it's, a, it's the little red hand revisited. So um, one spring day, the little red hen had an idea. She thought that it would be a great improvement to the barnyard if they could add some diversity to their menu. Instead of the daily pecking at dried corn and munching of hay, the citizens of the barnyard would benefit from having some freshly baked bread in their diet. What an improvement that would be, thought the little red hen. Bread will enable some barnyard citizens who cannot easily digest hay or dried corn to obtain important nourishment. It will make us all stronger. So the little red hen asked the citizens of the barnyard to help her. Who will help me till the soil and plant the seed? Who will help me weed the field and water the soil? Who will help me harvest the wheat and mill the grain? And who will help me bake the bread? So the little red hen went around. She asked the barnyard dog if he could help. Well, I really admire your spunk and all, but the barnyard has survived just fine without baked bread. If it's not broken, don't fix it, I say. And this doesn't affect me anyway, because I'm a dog and the, far the farmer feeds me dog food. I don't have to eat that hay or peck at, peck at seeds. So that I'm out. So next, the uh, hand, the little red hen, went to the barnyard cow. The barnyard cow was the most senior citizen of the barnyard. And she responded, well, I don't wanna be part of this conversation because it sounds like you're being critical of our current diet. And that makes me uncomfortable and I feel guilty. I don't wanna be blamed for the fact that we didn't try this idea many years ago. Well, the barnyard pig was next. Well, now then he said, Miss Hen, you go right ahead and you try out your nice little idea. Of course, I'm busy with all of my enormous responsibilities here, so I don't have time to help, but I know you'll do a good job and I'll be watching. And so finally, the little red hen went to the, the billy goat. The goat was the boss of the barnyard. Well, to show you how much I support your work, I'll arrange for you to be able to apply for a grant so that you can purchase some of the farming equipment that you're going to need. Well, because no one was able to help, the little red hen went ahead and did it herself. She learned how to grow the wheat, mill the grain, bake the bread. And of course, along the way, she made some mistakes, but she learned from them. And in the end, just as a little red hen had predicted, the bread was good, and all of the barnyard enjoyed the new item in their diet. 
And so it came to pass that every year, the little red hen went about her tasks. She tilled the soil and planted the seeds. She weeded the field and watered the soil. She harvested the wheat, she milled the grain, she baked the bread and everyone enjoyed eating the bread. And then one day it happened. The little red hen decided to retire. And because the dog and the cow and the pig and the goat and all the other citizens of the barnyard had not learned the skills of farming and milling and baking, because none of them had had the courage to change, because none of them had had the time to try new ideas, because none of them had been willing to share in the responsibility, the barnyard never again had freshly baked bread. So we aspire to a new scientific culture in which equity and inclusion become embedded institutional values. Culture change does not happen because of fancy rhetoric or strategic plans, nor will culture change happen just because we throw money at it. Culture change will be made real only when many people from many perspectives find a time to collectively change our structures and behaviors. So I appreciate your attention today, and um, I think we might have a few minutes for uh, for discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, for sharing with us some really practical things for us to think about. Um, and I know you're just getting to the this, this surface level, so it's really great that we have a little bit more time to talk about um, ask some more questions, I realized our mic just ran out of battery. So for those of you who want to ask questions in um, to Dr. Asai, I think you'll just have to talk loudly or come a little bit closer to the mic is right here, where um, if he can't hear you, if you don't have a loud voice, go ahead and come a little bit closer. Um, and maybe what we'll do is we'll start with a question from people on Zoom, because we already have a mic right next to them. So would anybody on Zoom like to ask a question? I think Luis has a question. So uh, David, thank you very much for your wonderful talk and, and for uh, bringing to the campus uh, this conversation. So um, I have had experiences where uh, conversations with the deans uh, where I ask about talking about race and ethnicity. And normally you find a very strong reaction about bringing any of these topics. And uh, so I can see, you know, their, their, their position is that uh, race and ethnicity normally uh, is, is associated with Office of Equal Opportunity and Diversity, uh, you know, uh, legal situations and so on. So uh, my question is, uh, how can we start the conversation? As, as you uh, pointed out, just the, the barely, you know, beginning of the conversation, right? This is uh, just, just to start, you know, opening up because the students want to talk about that. Uh, staff want to talk about that. The peers that you mentioned in your talk, they want to talk about that because, uh, you know, they, they are always open. And perhaps, you know, what, what other people uh, in the room don't want to listen to those things as well. So it's, it's a, a matter of, uh, um, it's a culture, it's a change of culture, as, as you are saying, about uh, just start talking, just, just begin and uh, not find such a strong repression to talk about uh, race and ethnicity and uh, different ways to look at things. Uh, thank you, Luis. You know, I, I was telling you a little bit about my story from 20 years ago. Uh, and, you know, even today, right, we, we don't, we don't have, we, we don't practice talking about race and ethnicity. It's usually something that we don't want to talk about. So we don't know how. And so practicing is really helpful. Um, I think it's important for scientists, for, for persons who are in the STEM fields to have those conversations in a way where we can feel safe. So those first workshops that I talked about at Purdue, they've been started at the schools of engineering because the engineers realize that their students needed to work in the real world. And that even though Purdue was fairly homogeneous, that didn't mean that the real world was homogeneous, that there's all kinds of different people there. Um, 
And so they brought in folks from th this group actually had worked at DuPont. So they brought him into Purdue. And so the faculty were going through these workshops. And then the folks in science, I was in the School of Science and the School of Agriculture said, well, you know, we should also be doing this. And so that's how it, be, it, it happened, right? And so, yeah, I get it that there are offices for diversity, equity, and inclusion, or wh whatever whatever you call it at, at your place. And those are, those are obviously important people, but we have to be sure that we all take the responsibility to learn this stuff, that it's not just left to, you know, the experts over there in that office of diversity. It's also important for the people who are doing computational science or engineering or biology, uh, because we are the ones who also interact with students and we just have to get better at this. You're absolutely right. I think the student, well, I, I hope many of the students want to do this. And uh, there have been surveys which show that um, when you ask the students, is it important to talk about differences? Uh, virtually all of them say yes, right? It's very important to talk about differences. But when we talk to the faculty, to the, to the mentors, uh, most of us say, no, we, we don't want to talk about differences. It's scary because we don't know how to do it. So my point is that we can practice, we can learn how to do this. So I'll, I'll shut up here in, in a second. But one of the things that we can do, if, if you're interested, if you and your colleagues are interested, is that, is that we will provide a small matching grant to UCI or to a department there for faculty discussions about race. They have to be facilitated uh, and so forth. UCLA up the road has done this, uh, I think for three years in a row now with our support. Uh, there have been other places in this country where we've provided this stuff. And so these are just facilitated conversations. You choose a facilitator, we don't choose it. And you have to you know, bring 25, 30 people together to really have some of these hard conversations. It's, it was um, absolutely transformational for me um, 20 years ago. And um, I, think it, I think it can be the same for others as well. So. Just as a, quickly as, as a follow up. So something that, that we have been doing uh, in our seminar series, we invite a faculty to talk with our students. And so normal, we normally uh, we don't invite uh, you know, faculty who are from the peers group, right? And so I asked them to, to tell uh, the students how they became scientists and, uh, you know, uh, kind of tell, you know, their, their story about, uh, you know, when they were a child or what, what was that motivate them to get into a PhD and so on. And so without asking, you know, uh, race or ethnicity, it comes through that because, you know, they start bringing about, you know, their family and I grew up in this place and, and so on. And so this is a kind of a casual conversation, but also it's something that the students very much appreciate. I, I let me tell you, I have learned so much about how people become scientists in, in you know, through so many different paths and, uh, and you know, uh, situations in a school, family, uh, neighborhood, friends, and so on. Thank you very much. Would anybody in the room like to ask a question? Hi, David. I don't know if you can tell with both my hat and mask. It's Michael <laughs> Bennett. Um, great talk. Um, can you hear me from how far away I am from the microphone? Hi, Michael. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I don't know that I really have a question, but maybe just ask you to expand a bit on your experience with the, the time factor, because I do think it, it, it impacted at so many levels. Um, and I totally agree with you. And, and first of all, I, I want to thank you for your just directness about the competitive exclusive nature versus the inclusive nature. So that was amazing. I've heard you talk a lot, and I think that was the most direct and clearest I heard you on that. And it's a message I think is absolutely critical. So thank you. Um, on the timeline, you know, it's something we certainly struggle with is, is, you know, pulling out that week, as you said, where you stop all other activities, because there are weird pressures at every level, right? There's the, you know, the department level to do things, then there's the school level, then there's the national level, you know, people are like, well, I have my grants and they're expecting me to get stuff done. So there's like this first culture change of we don't have to actually work 24 seven and be crazy and kill ourselves as faculty. 
that seems to be necessary to get the real culture change we want that you brought up. We've got to change our view of time as well as our views on all of these race and inclusion and other issues. Um, do you have thought strategies where people have been able to be successful other than just obviously they reach the point where they finally commit to it, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so, so certainly you don't have to take a week off like like I was suggesting. You can oh, I love that, that idea, by the way. way. I would love to get there. <laughs> Um, but actually, what inspired me to think about taking a week off was a strategic planning exercise that I had done when I was uh, chair of biology up at Harvey Mudd. And um, it, you know, universities and colleges write strategic plans. I've read, well, I've looked at Irvine's strategic plan. Um, you mentioned the word excel, excellence or excel 17 times. And so if you're all about excellence, and I, and I believe Irvine also has, to, has put out statements about how important diversity and, and equity and inclusion are. I know that you've gone through some uh, challenging times recently in terms of changing the names of a building and, and things of that sort, all very, very appropriate. So if we're, if we're serious about this stuff, then it's a strategic planning exercise just as we did at MUD, which is we took a week off and you know, it was, it, it, we didn't just take a week off, it was organized, right? So we, we knew what to do with that week. Um, but it was, a, it was then a convening of as many of the stakeholders as could be, students, faculty, staff, administrators, and alumni in groups to talk about some of the important things that we don't normally talk about. And what then emerged, this is Maria Clave, who, was our, who is our president there, um, you know, what emerged then is a strategic plan, which I think was very effective because it actually was owned by all of us. It wasn't just some committee, right? It was all of us. And um, that experience doesn't have to be replicated exactly, but that's what sort of inspires me to think about how we might make DEI as important as we say it is to actually make it happen. And the truth is, Michael, and we all know this, whoever's on the call here, we're busy, right? We got other stuff to do. And if something is important, then we, we have to find the time to do it. And that means we don't do other things. So it's really not for me to say what's important for you and for your, your uh, college and, 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 and Irvine, but if it is important, if inclusion and diversity and equity of anti-racism, if it is important, then I'm afraid we're gonna to have to figure out a way to put some time in and to do it in a way that it involves as many people as we can to have those conversations and, and you know, um, to, to begin that process. If it's not important, then we'll just, it'll just be an add-on, right? It'll just be an extra thing that, by the way, if you have extra time, you know, let's let's do this. So, just thinking about how you might make the introductory uh, STEM curriculum. Uh, well, I'm a biologist, so I'll think about biology or physics or, or whatever your discipline. If you just think about the introductory courses that we take, if if you just want to take that on, that's huge all in itself. How can we make that more inclusive? Well, you can't ask your faculty to do this on top of everything else they're doing. And so they're gonna to have to take some time to redesign the, that course or, the, or that curriculum. Um, yeah. So I'm sorry, oh, I, I, don't have the an, I don't have the answer, but I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that if we don't start figuring out how to find the time, we will be having the same conversation 20 years from now. Okay. No, thank you, David. And I think something you said, it really is, if, you're, if it honestly is a priority, then you can find the time. And I think that's the question we just have to ask ourselves. Is it, is it really that priority? Is it really something we we're saying we would like, but you know, only if it happens as an extra. So thank you for that. That was, I think that's really important for us to emphasize. Yeah, Katie, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, hi, uh, thank you for that, that presentation. I really, 
found it very powerful and impactful. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at UCI. One of the things that you mentioned was about kind of setting goals and then check, coming back in a year and um, and checking, right, and, and assessing. And, and I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that after a year assessment, because I think a lot of these things, the, the culture change, it's hard to quantify and measure in meaningful ways. It's, it's easier to say, like, we've done this workshop or checked that box, but I feel like those are kind of superficial quantifications. So I was wondering if you could reflect more on that. Right. And so, I mean, that's, that's exact, that's an excellent point. So when we decide what to do in this, in this coming year, we need to decide to do something that is measurable. So it isn't just some vague, well, we're going to make everything better, or we're going to make our culture better, or we're going to have a workshop, but rather we're going to have a workshop with this outcome in mind, we, or, we're going to, or we're going to examine the introductory curriculum, or we're going to look at our uh, promotion and tenure, or we're going to look at um, our admissions requirements, or we're going to look at, you know, and so very specific things where we can then, more than just checking off the box, we can say, all right, we changed the curriculum, we changed the prerequisites, or we didn't change the curriculum, or, you know, and if we didn't, which would be perfectly understandable, then we could, we could say, well, why didn't we, right? What, what, what did we run up against that didn't allow us to do this? Maybe we didn't have the time, maybe we didn't have the right people in the room, maybe, you know, there were other forces that were working against us, maybe it was a bad idea, but we got to do this in an iterative way so that, okay, so we do that one year, we do it again, we do it again, we do it again. And, you know, to me, that's how cultures change. Um, you know, I'm not a sociologist, but I believe that's how cultures change. And um, yeah, so. Okay, thank you. So good luck. I, I look forward to hearing all about the, the big changes. Um, there is a, um, there is a dog, David San Felipe. <laughs> yes, that's me. Hi, hi, David. <laughs> what kind of dog is it? Uh, it's a corgi. It's yeah. a corgi. Yeah. So like, yeah, thank you. Like the queen. Uh, yes. Oh yes, it's a tri called corgi. Well, thank you very much for connecting. You know, science to race and ethnicity. So I think one of the things that we also um, fail to realize is that race is a very complex thing. Yeah. That you know, it also like a. There's also a intersecting identities underneath, yes. underneath it. And a lot of that we also forget is like how allyship is very important, not only to students, but also to faculty. Like, you know, allies went to stop, went to stop in and to step back um, and recognize the importance of, you know, having a space for the community. I'm sorry, I'm coming from a social work background and also higher ed education background from my master. I think allyship is also one of the important things and providing space not only to students, but who's mostly speaking in the room, um, you know, and when that ally should step back and have, you know, for people to other people who have been silent by the system through, you know, and have that voice to speak up. Um, and that's also looking in towards to like a, a very multicultural education, which is like encompassing like every other cultures encompassing like other, you know, historical context and historical, I don't know even know what I'm saying, but I'm blabbing, but hopefully that's making sense. But, you know, not everyone or not every allies of aware how to approach and support students of color navigating us, especially big campus as, as UCI. You know what I mean? Yes. You know, when, as a first generation student, one of the things, things like you, you, find a sense of belonging but if you don't have this like community spaces like department wise and also like to a place to commune it's harder for them to find that sense of belonging I don't know and also I don't know and incorporating that in the syllabus too this is the resources that we offer that might I don't know improve your sense of belonging because you said it's a perspective right I don't know I don't know what I'm saying but hopefully it's making sense no I it, yeah, so you said it very well. It's a very complicated thing. And so thank you for, um, for sharing. I don't have the right answers. I don't have the answers. But I think that it's important that 
you and many others have the chance to talk about these things in a safe place so that people can begin to understand where you're coming from and what, what we mean by all of this. There is an interesting um, essay that you might have seen. It's by um, Marisela Martinez Cola, who is at Utah State, I believe. And she wrote an essay maybe a year ago, two years ago now, which is called, uh, the title is um, Collectors, Nightlights, Allies, Oh My. And uh, I, I can get you to reference if, if, you, if you want, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a nice essay to, for people to think about what it really means to be an ally and how you get there. Um, how a collector will commoditize diversity. You know, you, you, well, we have, we have this many people of color and we have, you know, we, we increase our numbers by this or we have this many, whatever, whatever the category. And a nightlight is a person who's, who, who, who gets it. They, they wanna help, but you know, they're, they're there to sort of help you navigate and, and assimilate into the system, right? So I, I'm, I got power, I'm gonna be with you, I'll show you how to make it here. And an ally is a person who actually is part of this, that you and the ally are peers, right? You are part of the same system and that and it isn't one person's responsibility to make you succeed, it's, everybody's responsibility. It's, it's something that we do together. And so uh, anyway, I, 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 I'm, I'm just reflecting on that. Yeah, thank you for that. Because it's also kind of described the entity of DEI, like, you know, I did the part, it's only yes. one entity doing all the work for the bigger university. Yes. Yes. So I kind of want like also that give that perspective that all the people doing one entity, one department is doing the bigger and encompasses all the diversity and inclusion for the whole university, which serves thousands of students. So thank you very much. Um, I do have to go, but I really appreciate this conversation and I would like to be in contact with you and also learn for that reference. So thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, Audrey has my email address, so so be, be happy to, yeah. Good to meet you, ma'am. Anne. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. I am. Um appreciate them. Um, I guess I wonder, I mean, it's very important for, for the students and people uh, to uh, want to organize and to feel part of a group and so forth to, to push diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it seems to me that in many cases, um, it's potentially able to move faster if you have a push from the top down. So for example, if the uh, administration or for example, in the case of NSF where they all of a sudden said, okay, you have to have broader impacts in your research proposals. And all the people, <laughs> proposal writers said, what's that? And why do I have to do this? And how is that science? But you know what, because they insisted all of a sudden you start seeing proposals that through time got better and better and more impactful in terms of increasing diversity. And I, I think that um, perhaps some of the biggest change can occur when you get the administrations of some of the institutions to, as you, as you pointed out, um, change thing rules in terms of promotion and tenure and put the pressure on the faculty who may or may not be more invested in that to actually uh, make some of the changes and to think uh, individually, if not collectively, about what they could be doing. And I was wondering what your reaction to that would be. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the faculty forums that I was talking about um, that I first attended when I was at Purdue, that was because the provost said that we were gonna do this. That was because my dean said that we're going to do this. When I, when my dean, who's a chemist, old school, you've heard me talk about this, I think, Anne. So when my yeah. dean said, you know, all of you department heads, you're going to go and spend a weekend doing this stuff. I said, you got to be kidding me, man. I mean, I, I'm busy. I'm, I'm a department head. I got a huge department. I got my research, my teaching. 
so you want me to spend three days, you know, we have to go away, right? So we went down to, we went, we went away and you want me to do this stuff. And so I asked my Dean, so what'd you learn? Cause he had done this and he came back all enthusiastic. He said, so I said, what, what'd you learn, Harry? Uh, and he said, well, you know, I learned that, um, you know, there was Jim Crow in the United States. I said, well, you know, I knew that. And he, and he said, well, and, and I learned that there were uh, Indian boarding schools. And I said, well, Harry, I already knew that. And he, and he said, and did you know that Japanese Americans were put into internment camps? And I says, yeah, Harry, <laughs> I knew that. And he said, you know, okay, so I'm not going to debate you. You're going to go. And the provost said, you're going to go. And so I went. And it wasn't about just learning about these facts. It was about how it felt to learn about these, how we could talk about these things. And so I'm glad that he, he didn't force me, but I'm glad that he encouraged me very strongly to go because I wouldn't have gone otherwise. And for me, that was transformative. I think for many of the people that went with me, that was transformative, uh, not because we became experts, not because we solved the problem of racism, but because we began to practice some of the skills that we needed to do. And of course, the challenge, right, with scientists, these were all scientists and engineers. We all want to solve the problem, right? So just tell me the problem and we'll find the answer. You know, none of this talking stuff, you know, just, just tell me the problem, we'll figure it out the answer. And so one of the things that we learn from those kinds of conversations is that it isn't just finding the answer and there it is, we're done but rather it's getting into the process. It's, learn, it's, it's really listening to our students and seeing what it feels like. And um, that takes a lot of practice. And um, I don't know about the rest of you, but that wasn't my training when I, when I came through school. So um, anyway, I, I think your point is excellent. Broader impacts, of course, have had a, 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 an, an impact, although I would suggest that, as you know, that the NSF could ramp that up and they could take it up to version yes. 2.0 because it's because it isn't just a formula. It's really asking for some for some real things. The NSF could ask for, so what time are you going to make to, to do this? Um, they could ask for uh, from the from the department head or from the dean. So how are you gonna how are you gonna carve out the time for this PI to do that work and, 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 and so forth? So that could happen and I think that could be effective. Yeah, I guess I was thinking of the, the, the universities and colleges as well. And right, well, they, uh, yeah. <laughs> we we so have my probably. friend Michael Denon right over there. Uh, and um, and I don't know who what else other people's uh, response. I know Luis is a, is, is a, is a, uh, uh, has influence on campus as well. So, um, you know, there are good people at Irvine um, who, who are in positions where they can begin to at least nudge and, and ask. Oh, and, and relative, having been here for a long time, it's certainly changed a lot within the last few years at a rate much faster than it ever did before. So that's good. Thanks. Um, any questions from somebody who hasn't asked a question yet? Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Claire. I'm an undergraduate student. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, is it Claire, you said? Yes. Hi, Claire. Hi, and I'm an undergraduate student. Um, I like how you talked about how sometimes the faculty is more hesitant to bring up differences and talk about diversity and uh, race. So how do we as students kind of like convey actionably to the faculty and professors that we want those talks and we're ready for those talks and differences? Yeah, and, and so by just saying what you just said, I think right there is important because I think that, you know, I identify as, I still identify as a faculty member. Um, I think that we're very reluctant to do something, what well, we, we might be reluctant to do things because it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, we don't want to say the wrong thing, right? I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody and then, my gosh, you know, get into trouble. So it's safer for me to just sort of talk about cell biology and not talk about some of the people who are cell biologists. And so I think hearing that from our students is really important. I think hearing from our students saying, you know, this is important. I'm okay talking about this. I'm okay if you make mistakes. 
I'm okay because I will make mistakes too. But until we talk about this stuff, you know, but the other thing is I don't have to just figure this out on my own. There are people who are experts at, lear at helping me learn how to talk about difference. There are people who are experts helping you learn how to talk about difference with your own students, with, if you're a TA, for example. And so it, it's not something that I just have to sort of have come, come up with in my own, you know, my own brain. Um, there are people who, can, who are really good at this. Um, and in my, at least in my experience, when we bring together uh, well-meaning people like you and me who want to learn more into a facilitated conversation led by experts, it can really lead to a better comfort in talking about these things. So right now, uh, recently, um, I've participated in a couple of workshops run by an organization called Crossroads. So Crossroads talks about anti-bias, anti-racism at an organizational level. And I found it really powerful because they're talking more about the organization rather than me. So I don't feel as guilty about, oh, you know, I didn't know that. Oh, it's not, you know, that. but rather it's thinking about HHMI. What, what could HHMI be doing better? And, and they did it through the lens of history. So they talked about the US history, history of um, uh, organizations. Um, and I found that kind of conversation really powerful, not because again, we came up with the answers, but because we had a bunch of folk in the room who were for, for some of us, the first time we were actually talking with each other about race. And, you know, many of the people were, uh, had not experienced perhaps as, um, racism as much as, 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 much as others. Uh, and, and so it's, it's scary, right, to talk about this stuff, you know. Um, but it was just a, it was just a comforting, comfortable way to, to do things. So if, if you or the person sitting to your left or if others, you know, as I said, we do have uh, these small grants that we we're happy to um, to consider awarding to you, whether it's a department or just a class or a, whatever level it is, to pay for bringing people together to have a deep facilitated conversation about difference and about race, about ethnicity. Uh, about intersections, about all, all of what, what, whatever you, 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 you choose to, to talk about. So, David, um, I'll add to that as an administrator in the room. You know, I tried to get something organized where I could, you know, use your money and get something here. There are a number of biologists now who have heard you say that and mentioned matching funds. They also know an administrator, me, who has access to matching funds. So maybe this yeah. time around we can get that to happen. Well, I'll I'll send to um, uh, Professor Liu the um, we have a little guide for how you apply for this. It's not a big deal. It's not a you know we we get applications at any time. I would encourage the people who are organizing it to to talk to me ahead of time so that we we sort of get on the same page. Uh, but it's something that I'm very proud of. It's a very you know minor sort of thing, but um, We've had about 12 now universities do it, various kinds of places. Um, and I don't know, I, 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 think it's, I think it can be very effective. You, you could talk to Tracy Johnson up at Berkeley, uh, sorry, up at UCLA, who um, was part of the UCLA group and sort of see what her experience was, for example. And so I'll go back and just comment a little bit about Claire's. I think also it's not just about like, oh, what can faculty apply for grants and matching funds? But I also think it's like, whenever you want to have change, you want it from all angles. And some faculty will really like listen when a student says, I want to talk about this. So it's not just like Michael Denon mm -hmm. saying like, we yes. have to do this, set apart three days for yes. this. Yes. We have to do this. And we're like, okay. Yeah. Um, but when I hear like, Oh, a student wants to talk about it now. Right. Like it's a second reason. Like yeah. I want to do it for my student. Um, so right. you just mentioned that one comment to like you're four professors one quarter. 
for professors another quarter, those little things add up. And I think I'm a really big proponent of grassroots kind of change. Um, I think recently we've seen like those things really have a lot of power. Yeah. So you do have power as a student too. Yes, thank you for, for pointing that out. I have you one might, question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, is this Audrey? I, I, I oh, yeah, sorry. I wanted to keep the camera on the audio. Okay, got it. It'll just be a, a voice from midair. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my question was, I feel like a lot of things you mentioned in your three R's and, and, and a lot of your, um, your work and your writing is values that we care about as scientists. It's not just good for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Absolutely. So some of the things that um, stood out to me are like, we care a lot about uh, discovery. That's something that when we evaluate, like what's a good scientist? It's like, it's a good discoverer. Um, it's someone who is comfortable with uncertainty. Those are things that we value. And those are the same things that we say are good um, that you've mentioned your R's. Or like we say we care about collaboration. We do know on the researcher end, like that's where the best science happens is collaboration. But then how do we, um, on, the, on the relationship between the student and the faculty, like how do we give grades that actually measure what we care about? Like how do we give a grade on discovery or your ability to be comfortable with uncertainty? Um, and then kind of on the administration faculty level, like how do we, incentivize and reward collaboration? So the kind of two questions um, for that for yeah. you. You know, there are enough um, course-based research experiences now, so CURES or CREES. We run one called the CFAGES course, where faculty have been doing this for quite a while, where students are engaged. These are introductory, so these are freshmen um, doing uh, doing research, and they're, they're making discoveries that we didn't know before, right? So they're, they're getting new knowledge. And uh, enough people now have been doing this where they have, I think, some pretty good ways of, of, of assigning grades, if you will, um, uh, because you do have to you know, assess uh, student learning. Uh, so I, I, would, I would encourage you to take a look at, if you haven't, um, at say the CFAGES, the, this SEA, CFAGES um, course, if you go to our website, uh, you can find it. <laughs> well, good luck. I, I hope you can find it. Our, our website's not always easy so to find. I, yeah, I'm familiar with C pages, and I, I'm happy okay. to share with anybody else who's interested. Okay, but uh, if you contact me or Vic Sivanathan, who who runs that from our site, um, I think that there that we could probably put you in touch with faculty who have grappled with that question and have have their own rubrics for. Um, for essentially evaluating the the student uh, progress, in terms of you know, uh, you know well the grade that they're going to get, um, uh, and your I'm sorry your second your second question. Yeah, well, it's about on administrator and faculty level. How do we yes. identify as a reward collaboration? Yeah, so that's that's uh, that's tough, right? And uh, again, it's got to be something where. Uh, we have to say, we, we have to put it into our, into our uh, policies uh, for uh, promotion and tenure, just how we view collaboration and what sort of credit a person will get for that. Um, it can be as simple as if you have a person who is, uh, I think about teaching. So if a person is, is co-teaching a course, uh, the department head, has the option of giving each of the two people that's co-teaching a course full credit for teaching that course. So that's an incentive to do it rather than, you know, you only get half a credit for doing this. Um, uh, we, I, I suspect you have joint appointments uh, at, at your place. And so when you have a joint appointment, you have to figure out which department is going to, is going to be the primary um, uh, one to review the faculty member as they as they progress, and uh, those kinds of things can be worked out ahead of time. And so so it's it's a matter of codifying uh, what we mean by collaboration, whether it's in teaching or research, and then it's a matter of of walking the walk, walking the talk. So when it when it comes time for promotion or for review, 
then um, you, you've got to have in place ways of, of, of evaluating uh, the, the, you know, whatever you've decided is important in terms of collaboration. I'm sure you already, you know, I'm not telling you stuff you don't know, but um, I, I, from experience, I can tell you that it's important to work these things out ahead of time uh, before a person finds themselves uh, up for promotion and it's vague as to what it, what it really matters, what counts and what doesn't count. Okay. Oh, yeah, go for it. David, can I just throw out one other thing on the grading that I noticed in this area? This is a great space to reach out to our humanities colleagues because the idea of grading on rubrics for things like critical thinking and these right. more abstract concepts, they've been doing for a while. Um, and we think it's all mysterious and undoable. And <laughs> a lot of this has been done. So, in addition right. to people who have done it, in labs and experiences yes. that David has talked about. We have colleagues right on campus who do this regularly. Right. I mean, and, and as I mentioned in my talk, uh, Michael, you know, if you if you ask your colleagues in say English, their introductory course, right? The, the yep. assignment is read a book or read a chapter, or read a poem or whatever you have to read, and then write a paper about whatever you thought, whatever you think that that book said or that poem said. And not everybody gets an A and not everybody gets an F. And so there, there, are, there are ways of evaluating that. Um, and you're absolutely correct. We, there's, there's a lot that we can learn if we, if we think outside of our own, little, um, our own little box. Thank you. I know we're coming to the end of our time here. Um, does anybody else wanna ask a question or make a comment, um, especially for people who haven't shared yet? So I just, I just placed in the chat the official website of the phages, see phages. Oh, it's in the chat, so I didn't show the chat screen on the one that's <laughs> I can get it to you, or it could come up later. <laughs> yeah, let me um, just end our time here. Thank you so much, David, for coming to talk with us, helping us um, actually not just think about things, but feel it too, I think. Um, so I think all of us are going to step away from this a little bit more motivated, I think, to do our part and not just talk the talk, um, well, whatever I, stage we are I, in. So thank I you know, so much. I know. You, you, you are where it actually happens. And so it's, it's never ending, but it's good work, right? It's good work to do. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing. And, um, I know that some of you are familiar with, with some ideas because you are involved with the inclusive excellence and with the driving change. And you have some Gilliam, um, you've had at least one Gilliam award there. And so you're, you are at least, some of you are at least partly familiar with, with, with some of these things. So um, anyway, we're, we're, I'm always happy to, to talk some more and I will send, uh, uh, I, I will try to remember, Audrey, to send you this, this guide for the uh, faculty forums conversations. If I, if I remember, I'll also send it to Michael. If I don't remember, then you all ought to remind me because um, I'll, I'll try to do it right now before I go home. Thank Sounds you so good. much. Um, we'll just give one more applause. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are here in person, um, we do have a lot of refreshments here. And we do need to go outdoors to enjoy the refreshments and we can talk more then. Um, I'm just gonna pack up the bag here and then I'll join you with refreshments. Would you mail me some refreshments, please? <laughs> um, we do not budget for that. 